highly anticipated Adventure Time Distant Lands is finally here! This four-part mini-series will focus on Marceline, Bubblegum, Finn, Jake, Peppermint Butler, and a few new faces, but its premiere episode is all about everyone's favorite gaming system, BMO. Because Distant Lands has such big shoes to fill following the culmination of arguably one of the best cartoons of the last decade, fans have been wondering, will these add-on episodes live up to Adventure Time? I'm Whitney Van Lanningham, and today I'm breaking down the BMO episode of Adventure Time Distant Lands. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our super nerd sponsor of the day, Charles Sheed. Thanks to mathematical adventurers like them, Nerdwire keeps the lights on another week. Check out the link below to our Patreon and see if a donation tier works for you. Now on to BMO! Just a heads up, Distant Lands was just released on HBO Max, and I want to give you all a chance to bask in its glory before I ruin it for you. This video will have a spoiler light review up top with a detailed spoiler breakdown in the tail end. If you consider casting information available online or character motivations to be spoilers, come back after you've watched the episode. I'll also give a warning before I broach the bigger spoilers later in the video. Cool. Adventure Time Distant Lands is an addendum to Adventure Time. The first episode, BMO, tells the story of Finn and Jake's sweet, quirky gaming system BMO and their journey through space. On a solo mission to Mars, BMO's spaceship is suddenly confronted by an alien service droid, Olive, that crash lands him on a strange space station. Aboard the space station are a variety of life forms, from space lard, bunny people, and everyone in between. One of the bunny people, a young girl named Y4, helps BMO navigate this weird new adventure spot. But with sinister forces lurking in each pod, it's up to BMO and Y4 to bring the unethical conspiracy to light. Going into this, I think a lot of fans want to know whether it lives up to the main series or if it's just another unnecessary sequel that's resurrecting a property for subscription views. I think it's safe to say that this does in fact feel like Peak Adventure Time, or to be more specific, a very BMO-centric episode of Peak Adventure Time, like BMO Lost. If you're expecting to see other fan favorites like Marceline, PB, and the boys, I could see this installment being lackluster. But that said, who in their right mind hates BMO? Once again, BMO is voiced by Nikki Yang, and like in the OG, she makes this character completely lovable in every way. Really nothing about this character is any different from the BMO we know and love from Adventure Time. We even get to see football again. The first new space pal we meet is Olive, an alien service droid that looks like a giant eyeball with an antenna at the top, or like a little martini Olive with only half a green toothpick. Olive also has some major Bill Cipher meets unowned vibes. Olive doesn't speak, but their character definitely impacts BMO's journey in a huge way. As we saw in the pre-release BMO promo, BMO is on their way to Mars to start a tater farm, when Olive sticks their self to the outside of BMO's ship and blasts them off to a mysterious new planet. Side quest, is this whole potato farming thing a reference to Matt Damon in The Martian? Because a large part of that potato farming had to do with poop. Where's BMO gonna get the poop? Olive is a wordless guide that not only introduces BMO to the space station, but also helps them navigate the various alien creatures and occasionally even protects them from danger. Like Jake the dog, Olive is a shapeshifter, and when BMO appoints themselves sheriff, Olive transforms into their hat, their megaphone, their sheriff star, and more. But Olive might have ulterior motives, based on their origins and allies, and I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but I definitely expect to see the outcome in future episodes. Next, we meet Y4, one of the many bunny people living on the space station. You might recognize the voice of Glory Curta from the remake of Final Fantasy VII. Although she's young, Y4 has a very important job working alongside her parents, who are big deal scientists. Her parents' job is to aid the leader of the space station, Hugo, in creating scientific inventions to aid the dying pods on the station. But although Y4 is a dutiful daughter and member of her community, she ends up developing a soft spot for Pimo and joining them on their adventures. Y4 is fascinated by tech, especially robots. Despite growing up under the strict rules of her parents, she's her own individual deep down. And although she sometimes wavers on the good guy, bad guy scale, she's ultimately a real softie. Y4 relies on her sweet gravity boots to get around and avoid danger, and the multiple magnetic functions of her boots become the highlight of several action sequences. If Y4 looks familiar to you, that's because we've seen this bunny species before in Adventure Time. Remember in the Season 9 episode Fiona and Cake and Fiona when the Ice King finds out that this Fiona is a fake? Their rabbit species is called Lagomorphic Humanoid and looks just like the bunnies on Y4's home. Could the other Fiona really be related to these guys? It might just be a random character of that species, but you never know. Y4's parents are KS2, played by Michelle Wong, and Dad. His name is just listed in the credits as Y4's dad, 
but he's voiced by Tom Kenny, so that's cool. Like I mentioned earlier, they're both scientists working for Mr. M and Hugo, collecting spare robot parts to create new inventions for Hugo. Honestly, y 4s mom and dad are kind of the worst. Their arguments go way beyond the average scope of parents just don't understand, and their unwillingness to listen to her or stray from what they think they know is pretty reflective of modern times. Not only do her parents interrupt or tune out everything their daughter says, KS2 and Dad are controlling, unreasonable, and single-mindedly focused on their marching orders. Although Y4 does her best to appease them, to bring them the parts they need, to do Hugo's bidding, and to warn them of the station's downfall, her mom's head is firmly planted in space sand, and her dad is too much of a doormat to stand up for himself and his kid. Like, you can tell the dad at least wants to hear Y4 out, but KS2 is not having any of it. Hugo, their boss, is an elf alien hybrid that acts as the Elon Musk of this new world. Not only is he the leader of the space station, he's also responsible for all of the technological advancements going on, including the employment of various creatures and even day-to-day -day services like food and supply dispensers throughout the city. Every citizen idolizes him, including Y4 and her parents, and he even asks for Bimo's help with his final project. I'm not gonna spoil his motivations for you because obviously he's a pretty big character, so I'm just gonna leave it at Elon Musk. Minus Grimes and the baby and the weird tweets. Mr. M is kind of the muscle for Hugo's whole enterprise. He's the enforcer who comes at you and makes you do your job faster, the guy who will fling you into danger just to get his bottom line. Plus, you can just tell by his mask that he's up to no good. There's some big theories about this guy in the spoiler section of the video, so stay tuned. We also see a familiar but still new face in the character Seiko, played by none other than the queen of shitty robots herself, Simone Gertz. Finally, if this blue space lard looks familiar, that's because their species has appeared in Adventure Time before. First appearing in the episode Astral Plane, space lards are one of the four species of lard, the others being sea lard, greed lard, and grass lard. Also, Bimo names the space lard Ricky, which you'll remember is the same name he gave the lost baby in the episode Bimo Lost. That Ricky's real name was Sparkles, and this guy's name is Twinkletoes, so I don't know what kind of problem Bimo has with glittery baby names. As for the quality of the episode itself, it has all the humor and heart we've grown to expect from AT. It's full of callbacks to the OG series, but it doesn't rely on them too heavily. The twists that are central to this episode's plot are a bit predictable, but there are also several details in the background that actually recontextualize the entire Adventure Time timeline and lore. So in that way, there are plenty of big twists worth watching for. Okay, so let's talk spoilers. Starting with a big one you might have missed, Mr. M. At first, I was going crazy trying to figure out why his voice sounded so familiar. But as soon as he said, Well, here comes the rascal. I knew it had to be Finn's dad, Martin Mertens. Here comes the rascal! Lo and behold, when the final credits popped up, Mr. M is voiced by Steven Root, who also voiced Martin. Side quest? I just realized that he's also the guy who played Milton in Office Space. So, you know, don't mess with his red swing line stapler. And like, come on guys, Mr. M as in Martin or Mertens? I think this means we're gonna finally learn more about where Finn's dad was during his initial rugged space scoundrel phase, and hopefully we'll tie into the other mini episodes to address the biggest unfinished plotline of the series. Finn has a rocky relationship with his estranged father, and if Mr. M truly is Martin Mertens, Distant Lands could bring some closure to Finn's parental angst. It's too early to tell if we'll see Mr. M again, but I think the odds are good that he, Olive, and Hugo will reappear throughout the miniseries to create a sense of cohesiveness between the episodes. Especially with that last moment between Hugo and Olive suggesting that they'll have an unlikely team-up at some point. I've also got my fingers crossed to see Y5 again. Bimo predicting her future as a mayor has me thinking that we might have an adult Y5 meet Finn and Jake down the line. Maybe she'll be getting really good at Card Wars, the game that she played with Mr. M, and have to play a match against Jake's daughter. One of the biggest shockers of the episode is that Distant Lands Bimo is a prequel to the main series, and tells the adventure that leads Bimo to adolescent Jake and Finn. This surprise was definitely unexpected, as seeing Bimo interact with football seemed like it was happening post-Jake and Finn era. Bimo blasting off to farm potatoes on Mars could mean a couple things. A, he was sent on a mission to make more food on Mars to bring back to Ooh, or B, Mo sent him into space for some reason, perhaps for his safety or as a rite of passage. Both of those things totally make sense to me. In the episode Too Young, Peppermint Butler tells Lemongrab that most of the Candy Kingdom's food supply comes from Mars. 
I know I made that dumb joke about the Martian earlier, but it's possible that Nemo's important mission was to make sure the post-apocalyptic citizens of Ooh don't starve. We also learned in past episodes that Mo wanted Bimo to be more for the future of humanity. So perhaps here one of his other creations sent Bimo to space to ensure their survival. Another big timeline surprise is that according to Sego, she and Hugo were around before the Mushroom War, meaning that by her nature of being a Bimo knockoff, Mo and Bimo existed before the Mushroom War too. That makes Bimo over a thousand years old as the main series takes place a thousand years after Nuclear Holocaust turned planet Earth into Ooh. Also, did you notice that when Bimo dies in this episode, he's surrounded by the same rainbow spirit versions of himself that appeared in the season seven episode, The More You Know, The Mo You Know? I thought that him killing Amo on his birthday was the first time those inner voices appeared to him, but apparently they show up anytime Bimo is experiencing a major life event. Being separated into pieces, dying, and getting rebuilt again all in the span of like 45 minutes seems just as major as pushing your robot brother off a cliff. Side quest, did you guys know that the end credits are actually a live video feed of BMO actually in space? In July 2019, Cartoon Network announced that they'd be sending a real life model of BMO created by Bob Hertzberg into space. Hertzberg initially created a lifelike replica of Bimo to go with his daughter's cosplay, but soon started developing the robot to be much more interactive. SpaceX launched a rocket with a version of the little living boy aboard, and now there's an actual Bimo in space! Dubbed Astro Bimo, this little buddy's space adventures are available to watch on Hertzberg's YouTube channel. And of course, at the end of this episode. Speaking of real life elements to the show, can we talk about how the whole Bimo episode was an allegory for climate change? Remember when I said earlier that Hugo is like Elon Musk without the LSD and the weirdness? Initially, we believe that Hugo bailed on Earth when the Great Mushroom War started, presumably taking with him only those he could save aboard his ship. But later on, we find out that he's working the citizens of the space station to the bone, trying to find a way off their dying home with no intention of saving any of them. Well, okay, he's gonna save the super rich people in his quote unquote inner circle, but how messed up is that? This is reflective of the modern anxiety we have about climate change and the pressure to find another inhabitable planet to continue the human race once Earth becomes uninhabitable. But like we learn in this episode, the average person's dream of surviving their home's total destruction will never be actualized. Sorry to suddenly be a huge bummer, but do you really think Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are gonna let you on their spaceship when the sun burns out? No, they're not. They're literally billionaires and they don't even know you exist. Hugo represents the evil elitist thinking behind the wealthy's disregard for lower life forms. You know how on the Titanic all the rich people get lifeboats and all the poor people drown? This is like the space version of that. And like Titanic, it's a real scenario that could very well repeat itself in the future if we don't get our ish together and save the planet. The moral of the story here is, rich people will make you do all the work for them and then they will let you die on a scorched planet. Hugo and people like him are not your friends. I personally hope we'll find out more about the survival of Y5 and her people in future episodes, but there's still two more unknown characters on the poster that I'm dying to know more about. If we get more to the space station story, great. But if not, it's at least given us a safe place to explore our fears that Elon Musk will totally blast off to become the ruler of an alien planet while we all deal with super malaria and whether or not our bunkers have proper airflow. These are just some of my thoughts on the BMO episode of Distant Lands, but I wanna know what you guys think in the comments. Like and subscribe to Nerdwire, and I'll be back to talk about Obsidian next time.